These days there's not that many people say to me, oh you shouldn't do that, or that's a bad idea, but for the Ironman there were quite a lot of people saying that. But to swim that distance and cycle 180k, which although I'm a cyclist, I never, never cycle that far. Even with a really fast bike time, I might have been thinking seven hours for the bike. So it felt really overwhelming and intimidating and a huge thing. And then to run a marathon, and I've not run a marathon for years. Bueno, viene todo motivado por el, el proyecto humanitario que viene detrás del, del proyecto. Y yo creo que hacer uno o noventa es, es lo mismo, es tener la motivación y, y la fuerza para, para hacerlo. The word impossible is in many cases enticing because it means that other people looking at a physical challenge have found it impossible and therefore haven't managed to do it. I would define impossible as something that we couldn't achieve having tried uh, and believe that we've done everything possible to achieve the impossible. I can't walk up a mountain, <laughs> that's impossible right now, but the process of becoming paralysed and then the adventures I've gone and had since and the, particularly the physical challenges that I've done since then, every single one of them has felt impossible at some point. So my very first thing I had to learn to do when I was paralysed was to sit up in bed and it took me months because I don't have any abdominal muscles. I couldn't find a way to sit up. I remember trying and trying and trying and then collapsing back on the bed and it, like it was in tears because I'm never going to be able to learn to sit up. And then it was about how to get into my wheelchair, how to p get dressed in my wheelchair, how was I ever going to... I remember having lessons from people about how to pull my trousers up when you sat in a wheelchair because how do you do that? Because you sat on them and it must be impossible. So, yeah. I think impossible is what we believe in our own mind is impossible at any point in time and that changes constantly and it's different for different people. It's absolutely amazing what the mind can do if you know what to do with it and you use your mind to advantage. You've got two options really, you know what I mean? You either give in or you think, okay, I'm going to stand up to this and I'm going to live my life and deal with the setbacks of it. I think I just really want to finish it. My biggest fear is that I've not trained for it properly. So I know I'm fit, but I haven't trained for it properly. And that feels a bit stupid. And from the outside, I think it could look quite arrogant that I could not have trained and tried to turn up to do one. But I don't feel like that at all. I'm aware that it's not ideal, but I'm also aware it's the only time of year I can do it so it doesn't interrupt my bike training or affect it in the wrong way. So it's the best that I've been able to do, unless I just didn't do it. Yeah, the night before, I felt exhausted <laughs> and really unprepared. I probably felt less prepared for it than maybe for anything in my life, really. Tape. <laughs> British tape. <laughs> yeah, we're just about to start. It feels well. It feels better now. I'm here, and some people have appeared, and it's all happening because you just kind of get on with it. But yeah, this morning, from waking up to getting here, I've just been feeling a sense of dread, as if I'm as something's like doomsday. But it's not a very good attitude to have. I need to sort of get my head into it, I think, and try and be feel more positive about it and look forward to it and enjoy it. But most of the morning I've just been feeling like, why did I shake his hand this winter? What have I let myself in for? And just really worried that my body can do it and not damage my shoulders. Yeah, you know, I rely on my shoulders completely for everything. And my arms, so I really love them and appreciate them. And <laughs> I don't want to 
hurt them and I'm, I guess I'm a bit worried about overdoing it. It's a long way just with one set of shoulders. I think for Karen, suddenly realizing that from being totally fit and right at the top form, that you're suddenly paralyzed, you either, like the vast majority of people in that situation, give in and accept it, or you really try to get on top of it, which Karen did and does, by attacking things that she realizes are physically and mentally very, very difficult. When somebody gets news which is really life-threatening, they might have to reappraise their world and sometimes in life we all take things for granted and I think when you realise something's going to be taken away from you for some people they suddenly appreciate what they've got and they'll see things in a different light and they may rediscover things so as children we tend to see colour very vividly as adults we take it for granted so I think sometimes I have experienced a number of people who've said I'm in a position where my life may be ended short and suddenly the world is a different place to live in and I remember one spring day, it was a really lovely sunny day outside and I asked if they might be able to wheel my bed outside. So this was after three months of being indoors and it was the most incredible, incredible day. I spent the whole day just looking at the sky and the clouds and the leaves on the trees and being blown away by the colours and the intensity of them and what I saw. It was, it was like very, very vivid and sort of mind-blowing experience and then asking if I could stay out there and bivy outside the hospital for the night and I was out there till midnight looking at the stars and just didn't want to come in. It really really gives you an appreciation for all the things that in everyday life you often just forget to appreciate. That very question crossed my mind this morning when I realised I'd agreed to be one Iron Man and how that feels. And the thought that he's done 90 this year, I can't imagine why anyone would want to do that. So, yeah, I mean, he's unbelievable. He, he just did one, like, he finished one yesterday morning. He'd been going all night after doing a shift at work. He's really something else. I, I can't even begin to get my head around it. It's actually really nice in there. It was like it's lo just the longest bath I've ever had. <laughs> and it was perfect having the, the paddle boards at the side. It meant I could really go in a straight line and just kept, could see them all the time. And, and it was easy to focus on the moment out there because it was just such a beautiful morning and I saw the sunrise over the sea. And I kept wondering if I was seeing things because I kept seeing, like, I thought there were white seagulls above my head and then I thought there's no seagulls in Mallorca. Then I thought maybe I'm getting deluded already. Then I realised it was all the aeroplanes flying away from Mallorca. <laughs> and then I thought everyone was sat on the aeroplanes, just like having little drinks and eating little snacks. So, yeah, becoming paralysed was my world's worst nightmare, as I'd predicted. And I couldn't, it wasn't easy and it wasn't good and it was horrible. And I've only recently remembered this, but my trip back to Hoi was my first time properly going to, into a place that I know it's not huge mountains but Hoi is quite mountainous and you can see the heather and the streams and the peat footpaths going up the hills and so it felt really raw and really close because I was pushing my wheelchair along a lane through all of this and I spent the whole weekend just absolutely traumatised by being there but not being able to be there kind of thing. A friend who'd been paralysed a few years longer than me, he'd had a skiing accident. I remember him saying to me that next time I was in the hills and I was really struggling, not in the hills, but next time I was looking at hills and wanting to be in them and remembering all these really painful memories, I should try and imagine I was a giant and that I had this giant's hand 
and the, uh, take the giant's hand and run it over all of the hilltops, all of the contours and the valleys and the streams and the textures and the bracken and the rock and da da da. And that if I did that, it would help. And it sounded completely crazy, but when I tried it, it really, it really, really worked. And again, it is just about a shift in our head in perspective. All it did was imagining that I was in the hills instead of looking at them and wanting to be in them completely shifted it and it really kind of worked as a little trick so our mind is very powerful <laughs> i feel like i'm ready to stop cycling it's rare that i say that <laughs> seven hours and 170 kilometers so it's probably gonna be about seven and a half hours i can't really contemplate the idea of running a marathon at the minute. Every single race I've done, I've had thoughts of quitting at various points, whether it's the first kilometre of the swim or halfway through the bike or the first you know, steps of the marathon. I've thought that it's not going to be my day and, and I'm in too much pain and it hurts too much and I want to pull out. But that other little voice tells me, tells me not to and compels me to keep going and then I'm so glad I have. I really do think it's important to stay in the moment and, and to not necessarily respond to, to the voices that are in your head continuously as, as the race progresses. All the way through the day you just think, I cannot physically carry on, I'm just exhausted and my hands can't grip anymore. And what really worked for me in those, at those times was instead of then focusing on the pain or how impossible it was going to be and how terrible I felt, I had this thing where I just suddenly went, this is interesting, I've never felt this bad before or I've never been in this situation before, I wonder what will happen next. You don't want to look wimpish in front of the other bloke, okay? Whereas if you're by yourself, there's no one watching you, it's not so easy. And you've got to realise that that wimpish voice is going to come at some point into your head. And therefore, you need the mental ammunition to fight it. And what I use to help fight the internal battle is my dad and my granddad, who are the people I sort of respect most. And I picture that they're actually there watching me. And I don't want to do something to let them down, like being the first one to give up. The, the physical side is what's making itself felt and it's what's making you want to stop. So you then start the mental thing. I've only got the moment and if we're so busy thinking about what might happen it's just all constructed rubbish in our mind we're just being anxious about stuff that we don't even know if it's it's totally unnecessary waste of energy to think about how you're going to deal with the next little bit so it doesn't do like it doesn't do any good to think about the past experience just trying to be in that moment and not getting anxious about what's coming or what's been is a really good way to enjoy what you're doing, but also do the best that you can in that situation. Smiling, just about. It's the only way. Once you stop smiling, it's all over, really. I think it could easily be four hours. I don't really know. About two and a half is the quickest I've ever done. Well, 220, but there's no way. I think four. Yeah. I think this is going to be the hardest thing of everything. But it's, it's made me realise that if I was on my own, this would be just so, the whole thing would be so gruelling. Because there's been so many people around and so much support and always someone swimming or cycling alongside me, it's made it really special and really made the time go really quickly. It's just that I think people just make everything. And yeah, people make things easy. Uh, it's amazing to be part of it. I should probably start a marathon now. That's the clock. Zero meters. I stand away, huh?
for anything that I do is to give it my very, very best. Whether that's academia, whether it's my job, whether it's triathlon, Ironman. My goal is always to, to do my best and there's something inside me that won't rest until I know I've given it absolutely everything and dealing with imperfections perfectly that was my definition of my su most successful race. I think that was my definition of a perfect race when you deal with imperfections perfectly rather than when everything goes absolutely according to plan because it rarely ever does. <laughs> Many of us seek out challenges because we're desperate to have the suffering or we're desperate to overcome, do something that we never thought we could do or just get through that difficulty so that, it can, so that we can then really appreciate sitting on the sofa afterwards or turning your tap on and having running water or whatever it might be that you didn't have in that challenge. Whether it's a self-inflicted challenge or whether it's one that life puts upon you, I think it's, it's an essential and amazingly special part of life, which without it, we, it would be so dull, really. Blue sky every day. How, could, how dull would that be? <laughs> Maybe that's sort of a metaphor for what it's like. I think if you want to do anything significant or achieve something difficult in life then it's not all just about fun and parties and beauty and nice places it's hard work and it's graft and it's routine and it's monotony <laughs> Side just feels to be going like that. It's very weird. <laughs> sí, para, para mí ha sido hoy algo muy especial. No solo hacía mi Iron Man número 90, sino le hemos puesto el, el título al día de hoy: eh, Superhéroes. Todas las personas tenemos alguna dificultad, y, pero tenemos la solución para poder superarlo y poder avanzar. Bueno, para mí hoy ha sido un regalo estar con Karen y ver todo el día cómo, cómo ha ido luchando y, y consiguiendo ese objetivo que tenía, un Iron Man, wow, un, un sueño. Hace unos meses hablábamos y, y soñábamos con, con eso, hacer un Iron Man juntos y poder conseguirlo. Y lo hemos conseguido. I think once you start, when you're in it, you're just in it. Like it reminds me of breaking my back and being paralyzed and everyone thinks it was so terrible. But when it happens to you, you're just getting on with it, so it's not as bad as it might seem. But it maybe just feels a bit like that. 
the kind of anticipation of it's worse than the actual thing, maybe. Maybe just the fear in our own heads is worse than actually how things are in the end. So yeah, it wasn't as bad as I thought. <laughs> but I might not be saying that tomorrow morning. The real heroes and heroines of, of Iron Man are those that are brave enough to take on the challenge. Regardless of whether they're an amateur or a professional, regardless of ability or, or disability, they inspire everyone else to, to test their limits and to challenge themselves and to believe that, that more is possible. If we look back at history, you know, impossible for someone to run a four minute mile until it's possible, until Roger Bannister does it. Impossible for women to run a marathon, their uteruses will fall out until Catherine Switzer runs at Boston in the 60s. So I think society, culture, our economy places different limits on us as individuals and dictates what might be possible and what isn't possible. I think if we continue to strive and continue to push our boundaries in many different facets, many different areas of our life, we'll slowly realise that what we thought was impossible is actually possible for us and for others to achieve.